beginning with the end in mind. So, you know, you're not, you don't need as many meetings. It's more transactional sales, getting somebody into the product. It changes your CTA. Uh, so instead of like speak to a rep, you know, try us out. Uh, other than that, it wouldn't change things too much. You'll still want to, you'll still want to highlight other customers who've been very successful. You'll want to highlight things with like no risk. Um, because you're not spending time or money to, to, to get into it. Bright Ideas episode number 354. Hey, I know what'll cheer you up. Welcome to the Bright Ideas podcast, where we let proven experts help you to find the next bright idea to implement in your business today. And now here's your host, Trent Deersmith. This is unbelievable. This true force has never been fully understood. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Bread Ideas podcast. As always, I'm your host, Trent Deersmid, and I am here to help you to discover the best growth hacks that you can start implementing in your business today. And the way that I do that is I bring on guests on the show who have proven track records and have achieved amazing things, and we try and get them to share all their best golden nuggets with you so that you can implement those gold nuggets in your business starting today. We're going to get to today's guest in just a minute. I've got a couple very quick announcements. Number one, if you are into Amazon, if you're an Amazon reseller and you want to be part of a thriving Amazon reseller community, I would strongly encourage that you go to brightideas.co slash Facebook and you'll be able to get involved in our community, network with other people, participate in hot seats, get answers to your most pressing questions, and overall just become more successful. Number two, if you want to know what's going on in my head on an ongoing basis and you want to see some of my best growth hacks, I do a lot of micro blogging on Twitter. So you can find me at Trent Deersmid on Twitter. And finally, we've got a sponsor for this episode. So let's have a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Flowster. If you run an e-commerce business and are struggling to effectively delegate your highly repetitive work to your team, Flowster's workflow management software and pre-made e-commerce playbooks make hiring, training, and delegating to your team an absolute breeze. Check it out today at flowster.app. Hey, Max. Welcome to the show. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we're going to talk a lot about B2B sales today, something that is near and dear to my heart because I actually own two different companies. We use B2B sales for both of them. And I'm sure many of the folks in my audience uh, also rely on B2B sales. But the thing is, it's getting harder and harder and harder to get people's attention and break through the door and so forth. So that's really what I want to focus on today. But for the folks, before we get into that, for the folks who aren't yet familiar with who you are, let's start there because you've done, uh, you've accomplished some pretty amazing things in the B2B space. Yeah, so kind of fell into B two B sales. Um, first thing in my career that I did, I was an I was an entrepreneur and uh, uh, came across a company called Udemy, which is an online education marketplace. They were looking for their first sales hire, and it was really like a um, uh, you know building a two sided marketplace. You're kind of like you're you're an entrepreneur of your own business inside of a business, and mine just happened to be the sales side of that business. And when I came at that problem. I approached it as an entrepreneur would. How, how do I do this in the most efficient way possible? How do I generate, generate more revenue using less resources? And that was the impetus and the foundation of sales hacking. Um, started Sales Hacker from there, which is our media company uh, for B2B, B2B salespeople. Grew that from zero to 80,000 uh, subscribers. We had conferences on uh, and New York, San Francisco, and, and London, uh, meetups in five different continents across 32 different cities. And then uh, in 2018, we were acquired by Outreach, uh, which is the leading sales engagement platform. I took over as the VP of marketing. I've since transitioned to the VP of sales engagement, focus on our own sales engagement practice and evangelizing sales engagement uh, to the masses. And um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a, a fun ride. I love working with salespeople. I love focusing on B2B sales and the trends that are happening in our space. And, uh, that's, uh, that's me in a nutshell. Also wrote a book called hacking sales and a, and a book called sales engagement, which I'm assuming people can find on Amazon. Yes. Okay. So 
I've been in sales all my life. Back in the day, I used to make cold calls. I used to make so many of them. Actually, I got written up in uh, James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, as the paperclip strategy guy, because I would take two baby jars and I'd move 120 paperclips every time I dialed the phone. Things have evolved a lot since those days because you didn't have voicemail back then and you didn't have electronic answering service. I mean, it was really fairly easy if you were willing to put in the elbow grease to get a number of people on the phone every day and book appointments and go out and do your stuff. Those days are long gone. And now we've got electronics and social media and email and a noise, a lot, a lot of noise. So why... What other ways or, or, or I guess the question is, is it's got a lot more difficult, especially in the last few years. What do you think the main reasons for that are? And then we're going to talk about how to solve those problems. Yeah, well, there's more companies, uh, you know, selling than ever before. And that just that, that keeps that keeps growing. I think uh, we've created a lot of channels now for people to sell on. So it's no longer just phone and and. Uh, you know, face to face, but you've got email, you've got LinkedIn, you've got all these other places that you can go to develop relationships. You can go to communities, um, you know, where people live. Um, so it's, 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 it's definitely grown as a, as a profession sales and the, uh, the barrier to entry has always been low, but you're starting to see more and more folks make a career out of it. So sales was also something that was kind of taboo and, you know, it was, oh, that's salesy. It's a, it has a negative connotation. And then uh, when SaaS companies really started to blow up, you started to see the people who went in, uh, you know, investment banking that came out of Ivy League schools that knew they could make like two or $300,000 right out the gate going to investment banking, but working 20 hours a day, now going into SaaS sales because they can make the same thing and log way less hours and have a really great career. So all of a sudden it got really competitive and, um, you know, all those, even though you have more channels, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're getting just as saturated. And then when you hit COVID hit, um, you had these two main channels in person and online and in person got completely wiped out. So now everybody is, you know, basically swimming down the, you know, the, the same path and, uh, you know, it makes it even for more, more saturation. So you have to find ways to adapt and pivot over time. And realize that there are no silver bullets in sales. I think like people are always trying to find these silver bullets. Like, oh, you know, if you you make these calls after this time or this thing and do this, it, it's going to work for you. And you know, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But you you have to find your own ways to A/B test the things that are working. You have to figure out what's going to work for your variables. What is your industry that you're selling to? What segment you're selling to? The types of people that you're selling to? The you know the roles, whatnot. People buy differently you know, uh, across the board. And there's so many different variables with your product and your time zone and your country, and whatever it is. So it's all about A-B testing. It's all about adapting and pivoting and not trying to fall into some trap where, you know, you read a, a book or a blog post and like, that's the definitive answer. Go just do that. It's a great place to start. But then what are the things you can do to pivot on that, iterate on that, to find the right thing for your business? All right. So takeaway number one is expect to experiment like mad. Because there's no mm-hmm. one best way. Yes. So let's talk about SaaS sales. It's a it's a topic near and dear to my heart. Being a SaaS founder yeah. myself, we actually so my company is Flowster, and we are now going after a. We're literally right in the middle of rolling out our new B two B first experiment. To be honest with you, and I'm super. I think this will make for great conversation. So our target is the decision makers at brands that make consumer products that are sold on Amazon because we offer them what's called an Amazon playbook, just a collection of standard operating procedures for running your Amazon seller central account. Very useful to a company that maybe doesn't know how to do all of that stuff. Yep. So what would it walk me through if, if you were my new VP of sales and we had this startup and I said, okay, Hey Max, this is our product. It's this thing. And you know, we're, we're also in that business. So we created the product to scratch our own edge. So I know that it's a very beneficial product and yep. that's our target audience we need to go get their attention. We need to go make our, say our first hundred sales, 20 sales, whatever it is, so that we can then layer on paid advertising and SEO and all the other stuff on top of it. What would that strategy look like? What are some of the experiments that you would run? I'm smiling because it's a very smooth move to get like a half hour of free consulting for your own business. <laughs> Why do you think I'm a podcast Yeah, host? exactly. No, it's genius. You're, you're onto something here. Um, no, it's a great question. And I, I like the way you laid it out. And, and so obviously set upselling your, your current base, um, seems like a no brainer. So th- those would be your, 
you know, your, your guinea pigs for it, you know, what, or, or whatnot. Um, next thing is, I mean, there's got to be a database or a list you can scrape or something of, of all the, the sellers on Amazon, if that's your yeah. target market, right? Exactly. Those are, those are people done that. Part. Yeah. Got the list. So you got that. So you got that. So are there other, are there common denominators that you can thread together with that list that'll allow you to lead score it? So, you know, what is your low hanging fruit? What are the, what are the people on that list that are most likely to buy? Like what do people have in common out of your current customers that you can mirror to create some kind of data lookalike? to the list of people who aren't customers yet. And once you have that, how do you go about creating messaging to the different cohorts of that list? So you might be able to segment that and say like, okay, well we find that when a seller has this many reviews on their product pages, they're more likely to purchase our product than, you know, if they, if they don't. Okay. So now you have that list, narrow it down on based on the reviews. You tell me, is there, is, are there, certain metrics that are publicly available that you can decipher whether or not a company is a better fit for your product or not right off the bat. Yeah. There's a lot of data available on Amazon. There's all sorts of tools that allow us to see estimates of the sales volume of a given product. There are are tools that allow us to see estimates of the sales of the, of, of all of the products for that brand and some of the trends, whether they've been going up or down or what have you. And we can also see the number of sellers that are for a a given brand. So our message is because typically a manufacturer didn't think about a direct to consumer strategy. They yeah. thought about selling into retail and then some of those retailers put the product on Amazon. And then over the years, what's happened is all the Amazon's become this wild, wild West sales channel for the brand that makes ABC widgets. And it's actually causing them a lot of problems. So our, we're, our approach is saying to them, look, why don't you just fire all those folks and, and have your own seller central account to which their response is, well, you know, we don't really know how to do that. And then I say, well, we've got all the procedures that you would ever need to be able to do that. And if you could follow yeah. a checklist, then here, this, this is a solution. For yeah. This is a very different customer. Like I've sold millions of dollars worth of this to a very different customer segment. So for us, um, I mean, the very first guy I told about this was ironically a guest on my podcast and he's running a brand that is buying brands. And as soon as I told him, he said, sign me up and we've got calls. And and so the very first customer loves it like crazy. Now we need to get customer two, three, four, five, six. Well, we've actually got about five by now, but you get the idea. It's still very, very new, but all that data is super available on Amazon. So my thinking is that, um, probably newer brands who don't yet have a lot of traction on Amazon and might be struggling to run their own seller central account for a lack of knowledge could be one cohort. And then another cohort could be legacy brands that have been doing this for years, but they're all of their sales are handled by these third party sellers and they're not doing it themselves. And, and as a result, they're not making nearly as much money from the Amazon channel as they could yeah. be. Cause if they cut out all the middlemen, that's more income for their income statement. Good. So you're able to, you're able to build an entire list of what your, your, you know, I, your TAM might look like uh, by by pulling every by pulling everybody who has a seller account on Amazon, and then you're able to create tiers of your ideal customer profile, which is not just your TAM, but also what attributes do they do they have that'll make them look like somebody who would be a buyer, you know, in the near term. And then you're able to tier that out, and you might say like your your low hanging fruit, your you know your your five star person has that plus these extra attributes. So we can tell, you know, um, how much, how much they're doing in sales, how long they've been on the platform for, if they're using a third party seller account, whatever it is, then that goes into your number one bucket. Number two, maybe has some, a few of the common denominators, but not as many number three and so on and so on. And so when you go to market, you want to go after your low hanging fruit first. Obviously it's the, the easiest wins for you. So you want, if you're, your your success you could have the best messaging in the world. You could have the best product in the world. But if you're going after somebody who's not likely to buy your product, then you're wasting your time. So your success in, in the very beginning is contingent on making sure you're going after people who are, are buyers. You don't want to be wasting an, a second of your time um, early on, especially. So then you go from there to the next, the, the next step, um, I guess, in, the, in, in your process. You've got your, your target audience. Um, 
it seems like you already have somebody who's happy with your product. That's beautiful because you can pull so much information out of them to help sell your future customers. So like, what are the things that they love about it? What, what are the things that they like couldn't live without? How are you framing the conversations with them um, in order to pull those nuggets of wisdom out of them so that you can use that in your sales process? Are there a customer, is there a customer story you can create that you can use as um, supporting evidence to like say, hey, real companies are getting real value out of this. So you've got that, that first one that loves it. You've got another five signed up. You've got enough to go create those materials and, and start telling that story and reaching out to those companies and, and getting, getting them to, to hear you know, how much success that, they're ha- uh, that other companies are having um, by using you guys. I think for companies that don't have any customers yet, uh, they have to go out and, and do customer development before they, they have the right to sell anything. And it actually is one of those interesting things where, you know, they think the old expression is like, if you ask for, if you need money, ask for advice. If you need advice, ask for, ask for money. Um, if you start asking companies in your space for advice, like, hey, would this be interesting to you? If you have any companies that you can ask that to, you might end up finding a customer out of that. But most importantly, you'll get, you'll get some information from them and saying like, well, you know, here's what we would pay. Here's what we would pay for. And here's how much we pay for it. And then you got to look at your product and say, okay, well, um, do I have what they would pay for? Are they interested in this or the pivots that I need to make or iterations that I need to make in order to make this thing, um, more viable. And I wouldn't just do that based off one company's opinion, but if you, you know, talk to five or 10 or 15 or 20 companies and you keep hearing that, then guess what? You got to go make those, you got to go make those moves because what you have right now, people aren't going to pay for, but what you could have people can pay for, and it might be just small tweaks and things like that. Okay. So let's assume that we've gone through that exercise and we've through sheer hustle have managed to sell maybe 10. And so we know that we've got pretty decent product market fit. Now we need to start scaling it up. We need to start building a team so obviously there's going to be messages that we're going to take what we learned from these conversations mm-hmm. from these first six, eight, 10 customers and try and weave that into our messaging as best we can. Where do we go from there? I mean, is it email? Is it LinkedIn? Are we going to tweet at these people? Like what, what are, what are the actual mechanisms of communication look like? And is it all manual? Yeah. Can we automate portions of it. This is where sales really starts to become you know, less and less of a silver bullet over time, which is, and it's, it's one of the things that it, it frustrates me about some of the, the content that, that is produced out there and the education that is out there. Cause everybody thinks like one size fits all like, all right, you're going to load these people up into, you know, a sequence and then you're going to mm-hmm. do a phone call and then an email and then a phone call and email. And then you'll do that for 14 days and it's done. It's like, that's not sales. Like we, and, and outreach, like we give you the technology to power successful sales teams, but you know, it, technology is a magnifying glass. So if you do things poorly, it's just going to be worse. It's, you're just going to do it worse. If you do things really well, it's going to magnify it. It's going to make it amazing. Um, and that, that was a, I think a direct quote from Bill Gates, the technology is a magnifying glass piece. I mean, that's like, it's well known across, across the industry. So um, you don't want to just, you want to be able to start trying some things um, right out of the gate and seeing what works and then iterating on that. But I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that, you know, there's any right or wrong answer to, to, you know, what that next step is. What I will say is the easiest thing to do is go find where those people live and understand what those people's day-to-days look like before you go and design any sort of, sequence or process for reaching out to them. So you've got these 10 customers. Can you talk to them and and ask them what their day-to-day looks like, where they spend their time? And what you might surface is like, okay, I'm never at a computer. I only check email on my phone. I don't listen to voicemails. I don't have time. Um, I, I do pick up cold calls. I don't pick up calls from, you know, numbers outside of X, Y, and Z. And again, you might find some consistent themes there. There are some things that might be, you know, obscure or, you know, only to that individual. But there's some, there, there could be some really consistent themes. Turns out your buyer never sits in front of a computer. 
they only ever read emails out of their phone. All right, so maybe that means you still email them, but your emails are completely different. You're not including, you know, um, long emails, uh, you know, a ton of information, you know, a bunch of PDFs and things like that. Maybe instead you're linking out to stuff or you're making it, you know, conversational, short and sweet, um, different call to action, whatever it is. But like understanding their day to day is very important for understanding like how you're going to get in touch with these people. If you find out that, uh, you know, the, the a vast amount of them um, don't pick up cold calls, but do listen to voicemails, then like leaving voicemails should be, you know, a, a key part of your initial, uh, you know, process. And again, you'll iterate over time based on the success that you're having. And, and, and the same thing with the, like the channels that you use, you know, the people you're selling to may never spend a second on LinkedIn. They don't live on LinkedIn. They don't spend any time on Twitter. You sell the salespeople, maybe they all spend their time on LinkedIn online, but they don't spend any time on Twitter. Okay, maybe LinkedIn's a good channel then if they spend that much time on LinkedIn to reach out to them, to send a compelling offer. Um, What about communities? Where are these people living online during their day-to-day? So if you're selling to Amazon sellers, are there communities that they spend time in on Facebook groups, on Reddit, on other threads that you can reach out to them on or, or you know, start to build relationships on uh, where, where, you know, you can, you can find them and, and uh, eventually sell to them. And I think the, the biggest thing is making sure you're delivering value and being a resource uh, and, a, and a trusted consultant and not seen as a salesperson. You want people to feel like they bought and not were sold to. And so how do you create that, that, that vibe, that persona? Um, it's really about creating um, value for people and for, for um, sharing industry knowledge. Even if it's not your content, it's just you can be an aggregator. That's fine. So let's assume then for the purposes of this conversation that we figured out that our tribe is looking at email on their desktop and they don't really pay attention to their phone. They're not on Twitter. They're not really on social much. Um, and so just hypothetically speaking, desktop email is the, yeah. it turns out to be the best channel for them. Now, obviously yeah. it's not going to be applicable across the board, but we'll just go down that road for a minute. If that was the conclusion what then, how then would you design your outreach campaign? You could do longer subject lines on emails, like questions, instead of just like one word or two word uh, that I would do on mobile because they wouldn't see the full question anyway on mobile. They'll see it on desktop. On uh, desktop, you can get creative with things that you can send. So you can send, um, you can send like PDFs and white papers and stuff like that, but like, I'm a big fan of throwing images into emails, uh, especially if somebody reads a lot of emails on desktop and you've got a product that's helping them directly with, um, you know, increasing sales, for example. So you can, you can almost like set up a side by side of a customer's dashboard before and after your use, put it in like one picture and put that in the email mm-hmm. and try that as the first email and just say, like, Hey, would you take a call if I could do this for your business? This is what we've done for other customers. Let's assume now that they were a mobile email user and not a desktop user. What would you do different? Shorter subject lines, um, more conversational. Ask them questions about their business. Just try and get a response. Like your your goal is to start a conversation um, in, in that case because you're probably not going to be able to get as much across with the way that they with how they interact and and in sales you really need to remember whether it's a transactional sale or like an enterprise super long cycle sale, the, the goal, um, the goal is to get to the next step. Like if, if you're a salesperson and you're thinking about you're, you're trying to get somebody on the phone to close a deal, you're thinking the wrong way. Like you should be trying to get somebody on the phone to have a conversation. And that conversation point is to get a meeting. And the point of that meeting is to get the next meeting. And the point of that meeting is to get like the NDA signed. And the point of that is to get this is like, you need to think about it in steps. 
And if you do that, you'll be way more successful because you'll be thinking about the next step and not like, oh, I got to close this deal. And if you're, so if you're in that first meeting and you're like, I got to close this deal, you're going to oversell, you're going to say too much, you're not going to do the right things. If you realize that like, you're not going to close this deal in that meeting and you need other stakeholders to be involved in order to close, this, like in order to eventually close this deal. And the next step is to get those stakeholders involved. Then you'll, then you, instead of overselling, you'll actually ask the right questions. Well, so who needs to be involved? And, you know, is there, you know, can we get a meeting set up with those folks and X, Y, and Z you're, you're building the blocks to, to get to the deal long-term. So when you're, when you're selling in, in this situation, even that, that, that first email or whatever it is, first phone call is just to get a more informed meeting or more informed phone call. And if you're, you know, in, in much more transactional sales, then a lot of times these touch bases are just little bits of marketing. It's like a law of effective frequency or law, or law of seven um, or rule of seven, I think it's called, which is it takes seven times for somebody to see your brand before they, they recognize it. And whether that your brand is your company name or your name individually, um, you know, it still could be a successful strategy to, to make sure you're staying on, on top of these folks and, um, you know, being, being seen. So in the SaaS space, there is um, product led growth and sales led growth. There's varying opinions on which is the more effective based upon our studies. And we are attempting to go with the product led growth strategy because the costs are lower. I sh in theory, won't have to employ as many salespeople. Our product is a, you know, you can get a 30 day trial and then it's just a, a, a relatively affordable subscription per month. So mm -hmm. if we're trying to use outbound to test our ability to get people to sign up without maybe even, ever even talking to us, how would that impact the messaging approach that you would take? Um, and when I say probably, talking to us, I mean talking yeah. like in person, like an actual sales call. So it, it probably would um, change just beginning with the end in mind. So, you know, you're not, you don't need as many meetings. It's more transactional sales, getting somebody into the product. It changes your CTA. Uh, so instead of like speak to a rep, you know, try us out. Uh, other than that, it wouldn't change things too much. You'll still want to, you'll still want to highlight other customers who've been very successful. You'll want to highlight things with like no risk. Um, because you're not spending time or money to, to, to get into it. Um, just still customer development and talking to your current customers and, and seeing with them, like what stood out to you about trying our product and how do we uh, magnify that when we speak to uh, prospects, put that in your messaging and, uh, and, and see how that works. I think, you know, the whole decision of going product led growth or, you know, sales rep is um, to me, less about the sales process and more about uh, adoption and, and customer success and onboarding. You can do product-led growth if people can get into your product by themselves and be successful. If they get into your product by themselves and then they never go back or they churn, they don't adopt, or they don't know how to use it or whatever, then you need, you need onboarding, you need sales reps, you need like, you need qualification because either the right people aren't using the product and they're just getting in there. And now like they're wasting your time and wasting your support, wasting your bandwidth, whatever it is. Um, or the right people are, but the product's too hard for them to really understand how to get value out of. And therefore they need some, some kind of handholding and whether, whether or not you have product led growth or, or salespeople, you're always going to have like support or CSMs that end up being your salespeople for some sort of an expansion because they come in, help the person that, you know, went in and onboarded themselves and then, you know, help them either expand from there or get, you know, better use of the product. So setting aside what we've already talked about, are there other significant mistakes that you see people making when it comes to their B2B sales efforts? Um, yeah, well, you know, the, the biggest thing I think is the whole silver bullets thing. The second biggest thing is tying to false um, attribution. Uh, so for the longest time, we've had reply rates as like a, a, a big metric that shows if 
you know, the things that you're doing are, are, are right. Um, now, finally, we're able to tie that to meetings booked. And we can throw reply rates out the window. And so this the, being able to tie attribution to the right metric is, is so important because, you know, re- reply rate was always, for me, the, 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 the closest way we could get to seeing if something was directionally accurate or not. Like, okay, these people replied to my email. Like, I know that their email works and I know that, like, my, my, my email resonated in some way, shape or form. But reply rate is not a great indicator of success because those replies can be objections or, or negative replies. And being able to tie to the meetings. Yeah, exactly. So being able to tie to the, the fact that a meeting was booked from that email or sequence or phone call or whatever is you know, so valuable to understanding if the things that you're doing are working. And so when we say there are no silver bullets, means you got to test everything that you're doing. You got to iterate, iterate on your process. And even, even once you find something that works, you have to understand that like at some point it's not going to work anymore. Other people are going to copy it. It's going to get saturated. People are used to hearing it. And then, you know, you have to find the new thing that works. So you should always be AB testing towards that, that end goal of, you know, that metric, that whatever that metric is for you, whether it's a meeting booked or it's a conversion, which it might be in your case. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's, that's the new number one for me. Okay. Do you have some, uh, favorite sales hacking tools or books or training resources that you'd like to list off? Yeah. Uh, so I wrote a book called hacking sales, which was for, you know, all things early stage sales and, and kind of went over a lot of the, the tools and technologies that exist in sales today. And that was uh, a book I wrote early, uh, in uh, let's see, it was 2015, so kind of like midway through the, the sales hacker journey, and then um, more recently wrote a book called Sales Engagement, which is um, how to engage with uh, companies in this ever changing environment. But some of the other ones I like range from you know the more tactical stuff, um, like uh, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss and Sales Acceleration Formula by um, Mark Roberts and Sales Development uh, by Trish Bertuzzi. I think it's I forgot the full name of her book, but if you type in sales development, Trish, Trish Bertuzzi, you'll find it. Then there's some like, uh, you know, Gap Selling by Jim Keenan um, uh, and all the, you know, Ian Arena and Jeb Blunt books are, are fairly good. And then there's the software, the, the, uh, software outreach. Um, clearly, clearly uh, got to get outreach. Yeah, I think there's, if you look at your stack, there's your CRM, which is your system of record. And then there's your sales engagement platform, which is your system of action. So, you, you know, you want to have a CRM, you want to have a sales engagement platform. Um, which, obviously, which do you classify yeah. outreach as the sales engagement platform? Outreach is a sales engagement platform. Yes. So we're your system of action, uh, data insights and, and workflows. And then you want to have um, like a, a net new data source. So like a Zoom info or... Um, you know, a lead IQ or uh, seamless or those types of companies, um, clear bit, what have you. And then uh, and Dun & Bradstreet. And then you want to have, um, uh, I, I think having chat these days is a must uh, and having an intent solution these days is a must. So having something like um, Bombora or Terminus, um, uh, demand base, six cents, one of those to tell you which, which, uh, which companies are trending in your space, which leads are more likely to close, um, you know, which companies you should be talking to, I think is, uh, a clear unfair advantage. Um, conversational intelligence, forecasting, there are a lot of other categories, uh, that, that, you know, start to come from there, but, um, we're living in a, in an age for the sales rep. That's like really, uh, really interesting and really fun because so much investment is going into technology for salespeople. And for so long, you know, it was just CRM uh, and, and maybe a data solution. So it's a really cool time. So let's finish up by talking about something that I know is you're pretty stoked about these days. And that's the new sentiment tracking for that outreach has recently released. Uh, I have no idea yeah. what that is. I did not get a chance to read up on it. So you're, this is my ears are hearing it for the first time. Yeah. So what is it? Why is it? And why, why should we care? Yeah. Uh, so it kind of goes back to that attribution piece. So um, in the past, you were only able to go off open rates and reply rates. And 
so what that means is you send an email out or you set up a sequence of emails and phone calls and you only understand if somebody opened your email and if they replied to it. But you can't really like at scale open up all those replies and see what those replies were. So you can have, an, uh, you can have a, a sequence that is uh, that has an email in it that has a high reply rate. But after that sequence, it doesn't actually book meetings. Mm-hmm. And you won't understand what's going on there. Now you can see, okay, well, are the replies objections? Are they positive? Are they uh, unsubscribes? Um, or they, do they fit in some other bucket? And then in the positives, like what were the, what were the categories of positives and what were the categories of negatives? So was this an objection on price? Was it an objection on, you know, check back next year? What were those different things? And it actually gives you, um, like a, a percentage inside of each one of those to understand, okay, so I'm getting a high reply rate on this but they're all negative replies. I should get rid of this email in my sequence. It's not working for me. And it also gives your uh, your managers a way to coach your reps towards handling some of these objections. So if you're going to get, you know, budgetary objections based on this message that you sent, here's a way that you can, you know, reply to it. Um, if you're going to get timeline objections based on this email sent, here's a way that you can re- respond to that. Or here's how Maybe we should be going and talking about this thing before we send it out um, in order to not get these objections. So sentiment just gives you positive and negative intent from uh, the, the person on the other end. And then we've also added uh, you know, attribution as the way to understand if you know, sequences are, are truly working or not before um, you weren't able to, to understand you know, what led to meetings book. You were just able to rank things based on all right, this one's having a really good you know, response rate. Let's keep running with this. And we, um, we realized that I think it was like um, some overwhelming number, like 40% of, uh, 40% of the ones we tested, the like reply rates were actually a bad indicator of an actual successful sequence. So it is, um, it's pretty significant. We're, we're really excited to get that out in the hands of uh, all of our reps and managers. Yeah, no doubt. So for something to, that I can include in the show notes, um, maybe just send me a link. If you've got a demo video, white papers, something that yeah. for people who are like, hey, I want to learn more about that. Um, yeah. Make sure you get that and I'll include it in the show notes. Yeah. All right, gang. Max, it's been a pleasure to have you on. If you want to get in touch with Max, you can find him on Twitter at Hack it Max, just like it sounds. I'm assuming that you uh, that would be your preferred way people get in touch. Yeah. Uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, I'm there, I'm active. Uh, so yeah, find me online. All right, Max, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Take care. Cool. Thanks, Trent. All right. That's it for this episode. If you enjoyed it and you haven't already done so, would love it if you would take a moment to like, rate and review the episode on your favorite podcast listening app. If you want to get to the show notes for today's episode, go to breadideas.co slash 354. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks very much for listening to the Bright Bright Ideas Ideas Podcast. Podcast. Check us out on the web at brightideas.co. All right, show's over. I'm tired.